The government of President Muhammadu Buhari in Nigeria is currently engaged in an intense revenue drive, the like of which has never been seen for quite some time in Nigeria. Officials of the administration have severally tried to explain that for government to continue to live up to its constitutional obligations towards Nigerian citizens, the people themselves must be ready to make a little more concession of a financial nature. For instance, in just under a year from now, the value-added tax will be increased up to 7.5% from its current rate of 5%. What exactly is the intention of government? Are Nigerians being overtaxed by this administration and with hundreds, if not thousands, of mineral resources locked under the Nigerian geographical territory? Why is the issue of revenue generation still a major source of funding for Nigerian governments? This is just one out of the many issues we will be taking up with our guest this morning, and he is Senator Adeshaye Ogunlewe, the chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, APC, and one time Nigerian Minister of Works. One of the first set of lawmakers under the current political dispensation, Senator Ogunlewe represented Lagos East Senatorial District between 1999 and 2003. We'll also be talking to him about the disintegrating infrastructure base in Lagos State, particularly the road networks, a matter which set him on a head-on collision with the then state government. In addition, he will be offering us his thoughts on a statement by his party that opposition politics is dead in Nigeria. Southwest politics, in the light of ongoing alignments and realignments ahead of 2023, President Buhari's new economic team, the likely impact of the continuing closure of the Nigerian Benin Republic border, food ins insecurity, among other issues, of urgent national importance. With that out of the way, we shall be moving on to speak with Tamwa Ashiru, the founder of Bulwark Intelligence, and she'll be looking at the issue of national security and insurgency. And as we hit the home stretch, it will be time to talk to Hanatu Sonny, a member of the National Executive Committee on Small Scale Women's Farmers Organization of Nigeria. And she'll help us get more understanding of Nigeria's food situation, even as the country joins the rest of the world in commemorating World Food Day today. We'll also be catching up on newsmaking headlines across the globe and review the newspapers with the Rice News analyst Emmanuel Efeni, while OGOP will be filling us in on what's trending around the world. It's going to be all of that and a whole lot more today on The Morning Show. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, on Tuesday projected that Nigeria's real economy will grow by 2.3% in 2019 and 2.5% in 2020, compared with 1.9% projected in 2018. Well... That's good news. Yeah, and better projections. Well, but I mean, the uh, IMF said a lot more. This is uh, part of the uh, World Economic Outlook um, interaction um, in uh, a meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. And some key officials, you know, uh, commented on the Nigerian uh, economy. But yes, the average uh, uh, growth rate for Africa for 2019 is supposed to be about 3.2%. For 2020, it's reported to be, you know, projected at 3.6%. So if you look at what is being projected for Nigeria, it's still below the uh, African average. But for me, what is uh, uh, more important are some of the uh, statements made by those who commented on the uh, Nigerian economy. They observe, uh, for example, that, you know, yes, the CBN has adopted a, a tight monetary policy, but there are still other challenges uh, in terms of structural reforms within the Nigerian economy because uh, per capita growth is low, you know, and that is probably what makes the uh, projected outlook a bit uh, sub subdued. So, in other words, they're saying that there, will be, there must be a, lot, a number of structural reforms. One of the issues raised uh, by one of the commentators is the issue of, uh, you know, the uh, foreign exchange window. And they are saying that you know, there should be, a, you know, a, a tighter, uh, not just even a tighter window, a more predictable window instead of this uh, multiple, yeah. multiple foreign exchange window yeah. that we have so that, 
you know, there will be no room for too much speculation and investors, you know, can have uh, greater certainty. Uh, the point was also made about the fact that uh, one of the reasons we have sluggish, uh, subdued, uh, you know, production is because, one, we're still heavily dependent on uh, oil prices, oil revenue. And because of the volatility of uh, oil revenue, there is a challenge there. And, of course, this is what the Bretton Woods institutions have always talked about. And hence the recommendation is that we should look in the direction of non-oil revenue generation. Uh, agricultural production may have helped to reduce uh, inflation, but our over-dependence on uh, oil revenue uh, remains a major problem. And then there is also comment about developing infrastructure, uh, investing in uh, social capital, you know, the usual things that we have always had, uh, and then also uh, paying uh, a greater attention to the youth uh, population, you know, to create jobs, uh, to check, uh, to check uh, you know, the crisis of unemployment uh, that we have uh, in the country. So these are, you know, ideas that, uh, you know, have been on the table all this while, but the important point that has been raised, of course, is the need for continued structural reforms. And they also made the point about the need to further strengthen uh, the banking system. Mm. You know, so these are some of the points, and I don't think that they are points that uh, we can argue with, even if uh, oftentimes government officials uh, say that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> commentators from IMF and World Bank uh, probably do not know enough about Nigeria. But I think that the points that have been made are of interest and they are valid. Well, I wondered your take, Dr. Abati and Leila, yeah. on their criticisms of the federal government or well, the CBN's mm. policy, Forex restriction of 43 items. They criticize that. How, what are your thoughts on that? Well, but I mean, you know, that's an issue we've dealt with uh, all the time, uh, you know, on this program. And opinion is divided. There are some people who continue to insist that the uh, monetary policies and even some of the fiscal measures that have been adopted by the CBN are in the best interest uh, of the economy, you know. And uh, there are those who also say, no, you can't have a multiple uh, foreign exchange window including uh, a window that is, uh, you know, uh, provided especially for, for pilgrims, you know, uh, going on uh, what you consider a private uh, trip. But the CBN governor has continuously also again insisted that, you know, he's doing that in order to provide more opportunities, you know, for industry and for investment, and that the plan is not to, uh, is not to uh, you know, play politics with a foreign exchange uh, window. Those 43 uh, food items that have been taken out of the uh, uh, forest list. Of course, you know, the standard excuse that was given by both the president and also the, uh, the city and governor is that this is supposed to help stimulate growth, you know, uh, within the uh, local uh, uh, production uh, system, you know, particularly the agricultural system, and to prevent a situation whereby Nigeria becomes a dumping ground for food items that can be easily produced in Nigeria. And if, of course, that's also the justification they gave in part for closing down the, uh, the border with the Republic of Benin. And of course, what we have seen in a re report that has been uh, released by the, the uh, National Bureau of Statistics is that this may have had a corresponding effect on, you know, the rise in uh, inflation rates that the National Bureau of Statistics just reported. Absolutely. And it's also a case of Nigeria getting to a point where we're food secure before, you know, it's understandable to see why they would criticize that because the argument is, are we food secure yet? And th the common answer is that no, we're not food secure yet. But really and truly, it's good to see that we have better projections coming forward. The question I wanted to also ask to the both of you, Tundu and Dr. Abasi, is with regards to the budget or the proposed 2020 budget that is heavily criticized as not having enough economic thinking behind it because Nigeria needs a lot more than that in order for us to achieve. How are these projections going to line up with what we have coming for 2020? What do you think? Well, I mean, the budget is still a proposal. Mm. You know, when people uh, talk about that uh, uh, budget, mm. they make it look as if it's already, finalized. it's already finalized. And that's why I said, you know, the various senators and other persons, you know, who have been commenting on it, they still have an opportunity to make input. Both the executive and the uh, legislature still have an opportunity uh, to take another look at it in the light of some of the uh, uh, in indices, you know, that I imagine, and in terms of the uh, projections. Okay, fair enough. But the issue, of course, will be where will you get the money from? You know, it's about revenue. And that's why, 
you know, the uh, IMF World Bank commentators are saying, if you depend on oil and you don't do a lot more mm -hmm. in, in the non-oil uh, non wow. aspect of your economy, then you could find yourself in a situation whereby, you know, even these projections uh, could, uh, could change. Yeah, and it's been long established that uh, project you know, benchmarks are wildly fantastical. Exactly. <laughs> you know anyway, consumer prices in Nigeria rose at a faster rate in September following a recent closure of the country's land borders with Benin Republic to combat smuggling activities coupled with foreign exchange ban on food imports. This is the country's fastest increase in four months. The country's inflation rate, a measure of composite changes in the prices of consumer goods and services, increased by 11.24% in September from a year earlier, compared with 11.02% in August. This is according to a report published by the National Bureau of Statistics, MBS. Meanwhile, the Nigeria Customs Service, NCS, has said no item will be exported or imported through the nation's land borders. Comptroller General of NCS, Hamid Ali, said, made the statement at a conference in Abuja on Monday. According to him, the measure would enable security agencies to be enabled to scan the goods entering the country. Ali also said for now, goods can only enter the country through the air and seaports, where they can undergo thorough scanning and certified fit for consumption. Wow. I mean, it's the... Uh, there's been an inflation surge in the past few months, but this is also a three and a half year high, which I imagine, as you referred to earlier, Dr. Abati, I cannot imagine that this was planned as a consequence of that border closure. They were looking at a very specific result, but these are the unintended consequences, and it's going to impact every single one of us. Our grocery bills mm -hmm. are going to gallop. And we spoke about these consequences. It's just funny how it's only the federal government that didn't take these it. things into yeah. concern and regard. Well, I mean, uh, you know, when uh, this measure was adopted, first starting with the uh, border with the Republic of Benin, and now extended, I think, uh, generally, um, you know, we had guests on this program to comment on it, including the uh, president of the Lagos uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and some other persons. And they said, look, long closure, you know, or what looks like a permanent closure of the land borders, you know, uh, could have serious implications for the economy. And that, in any case, that's like uh, something that runs counter uh, to the, even the spirit of the African, uh, you know, uh, continental trade agreement. But let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll com comment further on that. We'll take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still watching The Morning Show here on the Arise News Channel. Before we went on break, Tundu and uh, Leila, we were commenting on the report that inflation has uh, gone up to about 11.24%. Uh, uh, it was formerly in August, 11.22. Mm. And if you look at the uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, uh, report, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this will look like a major step back for both the monetary and the fiscal authorities. And those who have been hoping that perhaps at some point the uh, CBN or the Monetary Policy Committee will change its mind and uh, cut interest rates. That may not uh, now happen. And then, of course, if inflation continues to rise, then, of course, uh, that could throw a lot of projections, including the budget proposals, you know, uh, askew. But the uh, major point you made is about how you know, the closure of the borders is uh, responsible for this. And that indeed is one of the uh, points that have been raised by people, that look, once you close the borders, then of course you encourage a lot of uh, speculation. And then you create this kind of situation where you just have a sharp rise uh, in, uh, in inflation. Something that many Nigerians, the reduction in inflation that many Nigerians have been happy about, you know, and that even the monetary authorities had been celebrating. And in the MBS report, you see all the, uh, all the uh, you know, basic indicators going up, whether it's urban inflation or rural inflation or core inflation, which is the inflation you know, where you don't take uh, agricultural produce into consideration. Even food infl inflation, which was cited you know, uh, repeatedly as uh, one of the major uh, achievements because it had gone down, even food inflation has gone up. So we find a situation whereby, you know, um, Costs will rise, you know, there may be a greater hardship in the meantime. But the commentators, the people who know, the experts, they've said, well, it may not just be only the closure of the border. 
that has caused this problem. But we have seen what prolonged closure of the border can cause. So as one of the factors, they've talked about one, uh, rainfall, you know, heavy rainfall since June, how this has affected the routes and how this has affected the uh, transportation of, uh, of uh, produce. They've also said that, well, perhaps this has to do with, uh, with uh, the coming uh, Christmas season. And when Christmas is approaching, approaching, a lot of people will start, you know, stockpiling. Traders will stockpile so that they can make heavy profit uh, towards the uh, end of the year. Another factor that has also been cited uh, in the review of the uh, latest uh, figures from the Bureau of Statistics is that the proposed increase in VAT, value added tax, you know, um, is not part of law yet, but it's been proposed that already that may have led to some speculation, some kind of hoarding for people keeping certain things to be able to make a, a profit. Rice is affected, incidentally, the same rice that we say we're stopping from being uh, brought in. Cereals, uh, oils and fats, um, you know, even yam, even uh, potato, you know, all these have been affected by the, uh, by the inflation. But I think it will be a, a wake-up call for the monetary and fiscal authorities to take a look are the details that have come out from the Bureau of Statistics and to see what can be done, to see how, you know, uh, inflation can be brought down. It's certainly a wake-up call for the monetary and fiscal um, authorities because when, when the border closure was announced, this was a major conversation for everyone, that what's this going to do to inflation? And yes, there are other factors, but we have to understand the effect that the border closure has had on general trade and well-being talk less of actual inflation itself. And it's funny to see that the government maybe I, I hope they did see this coming at least because it'll be better than them not having seen this coming. Let's not take away from the fact that, yes, they did actually achieve quite a lot in terms of rice when it came to the border closure. I don't want to reel out the figures now because I don't have them with me. But when I looked at those figures, I said, OK, wow, they actually have stopped quite a lot of illegal trade when it comes to rice or illegal imports of rice into Nigeria. But this rate of inflation is not acceptable. It isn't, but at the other hand, I want to present the government's point of view mm. with uh, Zainab Ahmed borrowing a leaf from Donald Trump and saying Nigeria first. And according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, mm. Benin Republic is the world's largest exporter of rice. Yep. We are their number one customer. Yep, we cannot continue that. like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what the government is thinking. And perhaps for them, this is collateral damage, short-term damage that might be worth it in the long run. And that's actually we'll quite fair enough it in its own way, you know? Yes, that's yeah. represented. Anyway, moving on. The Nigerian Army on Tuesday asked Chairman of Senate Committee on the Army, Senator Ali Indume, to prove his claim that 847 soldiers had been lost to Boko Haram insurgency in the last six years. This is coming as Governor Bello Masari of Katsina State and his counterpart in Sokoto, Honorable Aminu Tambawal, called on the federal government to provide a special security subvention to Northwest states ravaged by banditry to adequately fund the peace deal and other security operations initiated by the governors. Indume, who spoke with reporters after contributing at Senate plenary to the debate on the general principle of the 2020 budget proposal, said the casualty figure was sourced from military authorities last week. But the military said the senator needed to substantiate his claim, even as it would not take issue with the federal legislature. Now, I'm kind of baffled by this, because he's the, Senate, um, he's the chairman of the Senate Committee on the Army. So asking him to substantiate a claim that he claims came from the military, I find it unnecessarily somewhat combative. The lady protests too much. As Shakespeare said, the military protests too much because he wasn't making any kind of attack. He was actually calling for more funding for the military, better equipment from the military. In saying that 440, 847 soldiers had died since um, 2013, he also sort of refuted that claim, that scandalous claim that 1,000 soldiers had died and yeah. been buried secretly. He was actually pro-military, so I, I don't understand why there's this pushback. Talking about the 1% in the budget as well and saying yes. how atrocious that is. He was so pro-military. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was surprised. You know, sometimes these spokespersons, you know, uh, some of our spokespersons in the various agencies, they just want to be seen to be doing uh, their work. I mean, I, I agree with you that the, uh, the response is... Uh, unnecessary. And in any case, what is even more, uh, you know, surprising there is that it is inadequate. 
If uh, Ali Ndume, who is the chairman of the uh, Senate Committee on Army, says 847 soldiers have died and have been buried, now the job of the spokesperson would then be to say, well, it's not 847, it's a so, so, so number. Exactly. And I think that Nigerians <laughs> would like to know, and that those spokespersons will go back and issue a statement and say this is the actual number, Ndume is wrong, because they are the ones who have the records. Exactly. But Senator Ali Ndume also made it clear that you know, um, he got the information from the military authorities during a visit to the northeast, to Borono State, uh, to visit, you know, um, the various uh, uh, formations on the battlefront uh, to see, you know, what level of welfare that the uh, military have for the uh, troops. That they even, he said they even visited the cemetery. And I, he, he got that figure from the cemetery. I, but he said, so, I think... Well, but he said they visited the cemetery to see the condition of the cemetery, and he expressed concern about uh, the welfare of the troops, and he said on the basis of that that he's surprised that the Ministry of Defense is given just about 100 billion naira in the, uh, in the 2020 uh, budget proposal, and that he believes that we still need to fund uh, defense very well. And he commended the gallantry, the commitment of the uh, Nigerian army, based on what he saw and based on uh, the interaction of his committee uh, with those guys, uh, you know, at the battlefront. So I don't think that he has said anything that is uh, beyond him or that is uh, out of place. And I think that, you know, it's just as well that the same military spokesmen have said that they have no plans to join issues with them. Now, there is a second leg to that, your story, about the governor, governors of the uh, Northwest uh, speaking through Governor Masari of Katsina State and Governor Tambua of uh, Sukutu State, asking the federal government to make available a special intervention uh, fund. We're reading that they barely stopped short of asking for a Northwest Development Commission. <laughs> you know, that, that was what I thought. But, you know, the, these governors of the Northwest, they've been uh, doing a lot, engaging with uh, uh, their counterparts in the uh, Nigeria Republic to address the issue of uh, cr uh, cross-border crime and to deal with issues of banditry, and uh, kidnapping. And they're asking for this special intervention fund uh, to uh, rehabilitate persons, you know, uh, to uh, address the challenge of internally displaced persons in the uh, Northwest, which is another issue that uh, Senator Ali Ndume also uh, talked about. And also uh, to uh, fund uh, the dialogue uh, that they are having with the, uh, with the bandits. I hope that does not amount to collecting money from the federal government to go and give to bandits. You know, uh, but if it is just uh, for administrative purposes, that would make sense. But not to go and bribe uh, bandits. We've condemned that. That, that, sh that should not be the objective. But this will not be the first time that the federal government of Nigeria will be asked to give a special intervention for. You will recall that in the past, uh, when we had uh, a flood crisis in Nigeria and food production was going to be adversely uh, affected, the Nigerian government provided some kind of support for some select states. And also, uh, states in the northeastern part uh, of Nigeria had at one point or the other, you know, been uh, supported because their economy was affected as a result of uh, Boko Haram terrorism. So I think it's uh, a request, you know, that the uh, federal government can consider as a way of encouraging these governors in the northwest who have shown interest in supporting the federal government in finding a solution uh, to the uh, challenge of crime and terrorism uh, in their areas. But as I said, uh, that uh, uh, special intervention fund, you know, the governors must be made to itemize what they want to do with that uh, fund. You know, there should be no diversion and the money should not be used to, to bribe bandits. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Honestly, that's just it. But, you know, um, he was also quoted in the report that I read. He was quoted as saying, I think the figure is around 847. But that's still no reason whatsoever for the army to come out with some sort of counterclaim in its own way, contesting what he's said. I mean, it's, it's, it's just far beyond the point. Really? Far beyond the point. Now in Hong Kong, pro-democracy lawmakers have fought a second attempt by Hong Kong's leader to deliver her annual policy speech. In chaotic scenes in the Legislative Council, Chief Executive Carrie Lam walked out after lawmakers interrupted her the first time. After a delay of a few minutes, she then walked back and tried again, but was again forced to stop as lawmakers again yelled and chanted. When the chairman suspended the session, Lam walked out again. 
Hong Kong is in the grip of months-long pro-democracy protests calling for universal suffrage and independent inquiry of police use of force, as well as other demands. All I can think of that it's a good job that she said from the beginning that she's not running for a second term. Thank she's goodness. two years into a five-year term. This has to be it. This uh, is terrible. She, she's probably not going to see the five years at this rate. But she might. Beijing supports her. Oh, yeah. But so, if she does, then things are going to be on fire. <laughs> well, that's all on the news headlines.